Welcome back to the OPEX podcast where fitness is explained. I am your host as always Robbie Burke and I'm joined on today's show once again by Sean McGovern. On this episode Sean and I discuss the intake process when consulting with a client about nutrition and lifestyle. This was a great episode with Sean guys. I know you're going to love it. Stay with us. Sean, it is great to have you back on the podcast, my man. So uh, since we last spoke, what has been going on in your life? Ooh, uh, Robbie, good to be back, man. Good to see you. Um, not too much, kind of the same old grind, you know, combination of, um, you know, being in um, education and, and trying to learn and, and better myself with, you know, kind of a 50-50 split between that and actually being in the trenches and working and uh, just finding new challenges on a daily basis. Our, uh, our kiddo got his first fever the other day. So, you know, going about that without um, drugs and, you know, against kind of uh, the standard um, care method of the, of the states here and not going straight for ibuprofen and things like that posed to be, uh, you know, one, an interesting moment when you have a, a climbing um, fever and it's just like, yeah, this is the body naturally killing something off. No need for alarm or anything like that. So, you know, kind of just working on uh, practicing what we preach and, you know, a world of the, the body can heal itself and, you know, we're, we're designed to be able to handle this stuff. So um, that's probably the most exciting thing going on right now. Um, but other than that, just a good combo of, um, you know, work and work and school and, you know, trying to refine my craft on a daily basis you have child services knocking down your door now after that <laughs> yeah, be careful what i say that's um, yes. yeah that's yes. it's just out of interest and like it's a whole can of worms and uh you don't have to answer if you don't want to but did you get your kids vaccinated we did uh i think we just did polio um yeah you know um we did we did an initial um, upon being um, birthed, for that matter, um, and then the only one that we actually re-upped on was uh, polio. So we avoided all the other ones, and uh, mm-hmm. I was armed with some good knowledge and some books to back me up that uh, that Fitzy set me up with. Um, so I could at least go go to bat with a little bit of material on uh, justification, and then. You know, the funny thing is half of these are like, well, if he gets to six months, then this one doesn't really apply anymore. So it's like, okay, the awesome that doesn't apply anymore like so was it really all that bad you know like it's all like about, the, about the yeah. money and worms scaring people you know and even we have a good pediatrician and they're still like well if your kid has a fever for more than 24 hours you need to come see us and it's like what like how like you mean you need to bill my insurance like <laughs> yeah yeah but, uh, i always um I always think, you know, if I was ever to go do stand up, I'd always do a skit on like, you know, how much I hate vac- vaccinations because it's, it's kept weak people alive. I'm like, you know, if Mother Nature just had a way. She would take all you motherfuckers out. You know, you're just here taking up space. You know, if the aliens came to take over the world, we couldn't depend on it. You'd be the ones like, you know, hanging on to us. You know, we'd be the ones hopping over walls and fighting our way through. And you'd be the weak people who can't do pull ups and are always sick. It's just like, you shouldn't even be here. Well, you know, in. In all fairness, selective pressure is strong, but it's, it's also because of that technology that my wife and my child are still alive. So without that, you know, a, a C-section, you know, without the ability to have a C-section, both of them may be dead right now. So I can't hate on everything within that um, as far as like the, um, <laughs> our technology allowing us to surpa- surpass that uh, pressure of natural selection, but um, it, it's got its benefits for sure. You're ruining me, skitch on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but let's get into our, our main topic. So, OPEX intake, um, which is part of the um, nourishment module on the CCP level one. So, what is, what's involved in uh, intake? Yeah, intake, you know, the more. I've um, thought about this in practice. It, it's kind of like um, for a new coach or um, you know an ever evolving coach, for that matter. It's one of those things that you're going to kind of go through cycles of. You know, when you start start first coaching, the best thing in the world is having like four pages of tests that you can like look at everything. You don't have to make any assumptions. Um, and there, you know, when you're newer to it, that you 
you don't want to have to make assumptions and you don't want to have to like read between the lines. You want as much information as possible. So I, I found myself kind of um, going in cycles of more questions, um, less questions, more questions, um, less questions, but better refined questions. And then, you know, kind of consistently going through that. So for intake for us, um, it's being able to um, really be able to read between the lines. And there, there's an art to that, right? So being able to look at a bunch of information and know what isn't on the paper that is being told by us by the answers as well as what's not being told um, by the way answers are given, right? And that, that's, a, that's a Sharon Preet thing in and of itself within conversation and, you know, gaining mastery in that area. Um, but within the components of looking at medical history, nutritional history, training history, all those things, it's, it's a fine line between consulting assessment, um, I mean, kind of everything, right? Program design and um, nutrition or nourishment um, on any fields, right? So if you pose the question to someone of, um, you know, tell me what your nutritional histories look like over the last year, and they have keto, paleo, zone, like everything listed on there, there, um, you can, you know, in, in given you're looking at this ahead of time before you actually sit down and consult with someone, you already have in, in the back of your head that this is someone that is either highly influenced by fads or they're impatient because they're not seeing the progress that they want because they're expecting, you know, the, the low hanging fruit to, you know, produce magic within a couple of weeks. And it's like, Oh crap, that didn't work. Let's go to the next one. This, this seems to work really well with people. And as you know, we've discussed before and, you know, we're very clear within the um, guidelines of CCP is like, there is no N equals one. Right. So it, it's pieces like that that give us an insight to, you know, the person themselves and kind of where they've been. And then also along those lines that we know that this person's playing with extremes within nutrition, right? So they didn't tell us any of that, right? But by looking at that, that answer and then seeing how they answer other questions, we can start to kind of get a, you know, start to, you know, if it, this was a, uh, paint by number type of picture that we're looking at, we can start to fill in a couple of those numbers and get a better idea of what the overall picture is. And, and hopefully by the time we get through a lot of those um, other answers or reading between the lines of some of these different answers, then we can start to illustrate what this picture is so that when we do sit down with the person, we can ask better and better questions because we need to be very resourceful with the time that we have with them. So Intake for that matter then turns into this process of trying to um, ask better questions as well as know what their history looks like so that A, um, we know what we're working against and B, um, we can start to solve some of um, those um, questions that come up within conversation like, well, I'm, you know, I'm really low energy and it's like, okay, cool. Well, I see you've been doing low carb for, um, for the last four years maybe there's a component here, right? So then, you know, the, your, your masculine brain starts going into like five different directions on problem solving, why that actually is, if it's feeding anaerobic gut bacteria, or if it's like thyroid as a secondary adrenal problem, or, you know, whatever the case may be based off of the fact that they've been running low, but then you can bounce that off of their training history and be like, all right, cool. You actually weren't doing very intense workouts. So maybe it doesn't have anything to do with that. Maybe there's another component, right? Maybe, there's a digestive issue. And then you're like, they, they poop seven times a day, right? And it's like, okay, cool. Now that changes that even more. Maybe it's a high fat diet that's limiting you from being able to properly assimilate everything because your motility is too fast, right? So you can really start to put together a lot of these pieces as long as you know what you're looking for, right? And we set folks up with, um, with a sample intake form um, for what uh, we use in CCP as a baseline to start to answer some of those questions for you. And also, you know, from a coaching coach's perspective, you know, it's on them to also the, the coaches that are using intake forms to ask themselves, why is questions like this so pertinent, right? Like, what can I learn from this? So one of the interesting ones that we often we have on ours is, you know, for female athletes, it's what, what's your uh, menstrual cycle like, right? So with no context, that's a very um, personal question to ask somebody, right? And, and, and definitely I've learned the hard way from asking folks that and then being like, you know, being offensive about it and being like, well, why does he keep asking me about this, right? But I didn't give him context on that. So that was my bad. And that was a learning experience for myself. But 
it's not our job to diagnose any of that or try to improve that, but it does give us a sense of, you know, if they've had an irregular cycle for X amount of years, you're like, okay, cool. There's something going on under the hood. We either need to refer out or we need to at least start working on balancing health, fitness, lifestyle, uh, nutrition to allow, you know, that be a product of you living a healthier life. And then it's like, Hey, this stuff started to regulate over time. And it's not that we're trying to do that or we're trying to fix that, but that is no different than someone having good looking skin or healthier skin from, you know, going off of processed foods and going to whole foods. Right. So it's not like we're like, Hey, you're coming to us to fix your skin. It's like you ate healthier. So the result was healthier, better looking skin, right? Like it happens all the time, but it, it's, it's more of a noticing based off of that, right? We're not trying to fix it. We're just looking at it in, in the context of fitness. So, so intake really, um, it's, it's looking at questions and deciphering why this is important and what we can learn about the client based off of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Um, and so just for the audience, um, is it an initial questionnaire and then a conversation or is it just straight into a conversation with a person with these kind of list of questions in front of you? Yeah, that would be the best practice is to have them fill out um, an intake form prior to meeting with you. So you can at least ha be armed with better questions because you're going to take those answers and then basically um, be able to ask them better questions, right? So uh, the funny one that always comes up in topic is, you know, you're like, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? And they write eight. Right now, paper eight looks amazing, right? And, and we may have chatted about this before, Robbie, but it's like you get you sit down with them, and then you're like, "Hey, so tell me about sleep." And they're like, "Sleep's really good," but my definition of sleep and yours may be better, and theirs may be completely different, right? So I'll go into it and be like, "So how many times do you wake up every night?" I don't even ask them how many. You know, like I'm like, "You wake up three or four times," and they're like. Yeah, that sounds about right. And it's like, now eight doesn't look so good, right? Is that like 60 minutes, 90 minutes, two hours, you know, like just these weird incremental pieces of sleep within there? Um, because on paper, that looks great, right? Um, and, you know, the same goes with something as simple as coffee. Um, you know, you're like, how many cups of coffee do you have? They're like, one, but it's a 32 ounce, but they didn't write 32 ounce, right? So it, it's small little pieces like that that give you a better insight. And, you know, you, you learn to ask more clarifying questions by finding out ugly truths down the line, right? Like I've had, I've had, you know, and it's a learning experience and then that makes you ask better questions, right? Just from the experience. Like I've had people, well, one specifically, because it's such a radical experience with it where they were like, yeah, I drink some coffee during the day. And it was a, it was a master's athlete. I didn't really think too much of it. Um, and it turned out she was drinking coffee from like 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. every single day. But, you know, being 54 or whatnot, that was like normal practice and didn't, seem, and didn't really even, adjust, didn't really change her energy levels all that much. But, you know, on a chemical level, you're like, wow, there's some serious things going on on an adaptation level as well as like, you know, things that have just become routine for 20 years at that point, but that changes prescription then, right? That, that starts to, to make you rethink like, okay, what's going on that's causing that versus um, how is that going to change my protocols later in the day? You know, um, I think we can take the diuretic component out of coffee at this point, but um, thinking of both positives and negatives that could be accumulating based off of coffee, you know, if it's, if it's a um, corporate brand or, um, commercially grown brand, like now we're like, all right, dang, man, like, yeah, she may be getting a decent amount of water in, which you could qualify or not, doesn't really matter, but it's like how many toxins are coming with that, mm. right? So the intake form not only gives us an idea of um, what the person's schedule looks like, but it also starts to give us an insight on their environment, right? And when you're sitting down with someone, you're like, you already have the whole program in their head just from like the first 30 minutes of the conversation you're like pumped to do this you're like all right so johnny like the first thing you need for you to be super successful is eight hours of sleep and drop the stress at work and they're like well let me tell you something about that coach i have to work 14 hours a week right now or i will lose my job and then i can't afford to feed my family and then i can't pay your ass right so it's like oh so hmm, we're not gonna get that sleep huh it's like all right, well, 
that is what it is. Let's hammer on the stuff that we can do. Let's reduce stress in areas that you may not even be thinking about yet. And it's the intake form that really gives us the sense of what their environment looks like so that we can help impact them to make changes in those areas to reduce that allostatic stress load to then allow them to be able to take on more changes um, or be more up to change and be able to um, maybe take on um, more intensity within their training or more volume, depending on, you know, the N equals one around that specific person. Mm, great stuff. So maybe let's just d- dig a little bit deeper into some of the questions that are asked in intake. I actually have the list here in front of me, just uh, in, in case, because um, you, you do go through quite a little bit. It's a, it's a lovely little intro video. It's about, I think it's 12 minutes on the, on the certification. Um, so we have goals, first of all. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. But the, with the medical, now you can get into goals if you want, but with the medical, you, you know, you talk about history, contraindications and meds. Um, which can be things that people easily look look over, you know, particularly with the contraindications. You know, if you're, you know, I suppose this really goes back to making sure you know your principles before sort of methods. Like if you're someone who's kind of really like, you know, you got to eat this way and it could be deleterious depending on a certain medication someone has. I think you gave a really good reference. Was it, was it what was the website you gave? Yeah. It's drugs.com. Drugs.com. Yeah, I was thinking that. But yeah. maybe, maybe just here, yeah, get into uh, medical there and discuss about uh, history, contraindications and um, meds. Yeah. Um, so obviously having some, <laughs> having some background and understanding what all this stuff means is, is super important, right? So whether that's taking um, more classes um, in university or finding some good stuff on Coursera that you can like mm. at least understand the importance behind vitals is going to be a huge component, right? So if somebody has um, low blood pressure issues or they're like, yeah, um, lying down and standing up changes a lot of things for me. And I have shifts yeah. in that and I get lightheaded and it's like, all right, cool. Do we want them doing burpees? That may be a horrible idea. Right. And what does transition time look between doing something like a, um, push up and then doing a squat later, right? Like, is there 15 seconds of rest or is there 90 seconds of rest? Like what, is, you know, like there, it starts to make you rethink some different pieces on that. Mm. Now, on a nutritional level, um, resources like drugs.com, and that's plural, um, is fantastic because any medications that are listed within there, um, you can pop that in and compare that to any, basically any supplement or other drug and see if they're contraindicated to them, each other and also what side effects are, which is a, another really good one, right? So you can, you have to be able to do your research on that or, Um, you know, outsource that to folks that can't answer those questions for you. So you could do some real dumb things to somebody and and produce some damage by giving them the wrong, um, you know, and and even if your heart's in the right place and you're making a recommendation, you're like, hey, I know this has been really good in this scenario, like X supplement, right? And then, you know, down the line, you realize that either they didn't tell you about a certain prescription, which then raises other questions, right? Um, Which is a fun one to go down or um, the interaction of X supplement or vitamin doesn't jive really good with this other prescription, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you need to be able to check your own uh, work, you know, prior to making recommendations like that. And, you know, that just raises the flags on like who should be making recommendations about that stuff. It's so easy to, jump on the bandwagon because of marketing and things like that and be like, yeah, people are talking about, um, you know, different supplements that help adrenals, things that do this, things that do that. Like, it's like, is that the right thing for that person? Like, or is that going to exacerbate another problem, you know, even more so? Um, so those things are huge. And obviously medical history then also leads into um, different components within uh, program design and assessment as well. When you start looking at injury and other issues along that. I mean, there's some dead giveaways when someone comes to you with like ulcer- ulcerative colitis and things like that. We're like, okay, digestion's already compromised in a sense. Like what is overall s- stress going to look like? How are we going to be able to um, make recommendations and support them as a resource to um, guide them in a direction where they're actually going to be able to assimilate that food and not flare something like that up? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. very good and i know you mentioned coursera there is there any particular resources you've uh, found helpful and is there anything you, you'd recommend to the audience like is there is there a very good book on maybe some contraindications with like nutrition medication or is there any any good re- even a, is there a good resource as a person like was there a seminar or anything you've taken or 
I think uh, Coursera actually has a course on human vitals. Um, Dirty, it, yeah, not, yeah um, it's definitely worth, I mean, I, I feel like if you're a professional coach, you should be way above that to begin with anyways, um, yeah. which, you know, is standard care and like obviously having CPR and stuff like that um, behind you if you're working with people in person is, is important. But um, I think there's no real baseline or there's no real ceiling to where somebody should be they should be trying to get past the baseline of understanding what those things mean and that could be just local resources for them um mm -hmm. as well as just exploring the intricacies of those things and the importances of them yeah. um but to circle back real quick goals is also a real interesting thing um and Sharon could probably talk a little bit more on that topic based off of you know what people are presenting to us versus what they actually put down on paper right or the one that a lot of us probably run into is they come to us for, for performance and then when it comes down to it abs are more important than how well they're doing and cutting weight is more important to look good versus um taking a hidden performance for that right so there, there's always a weird give and take so when you can go back to them and be like yeah we talked about this being your, your biggest thing and like well um you know what i mean so there's and, it, and it's not like there's no judgment towards that. It's just being able to flush those things out. So it's like, yeah, competition is my number one goal. It's like, all right, well, tell me what that looks like. And, and we can kind of talk about what that process is going to look like and expectations within there so that when you're, you know, tentatively writing long-term plans for people, you're not like getting hit sideways because it's, you know, it's May and now the person's going to go into a complete mental meltdown because they're five pounds over their, <laughs> their set point right or what they're used to be sitting at you know like oh my god it's almost beach season and i'm like running i'm running a little chub on this so um expectations and flossing that stuff out can save you some headaches <laughs> and also if you're if you're you know linearly um designing um in you know programming nutrition for people which you should be if you're if you're a coach and you're looking at all things being even then that, that's going to be something that is going to throw a wrench into any progressions within nutrition that you may be taking. Mm, great stuff. And just for the audience too, that Coursera course is free. All the courses on Coursera are free. Now you can decide to pay to get the certification, which is like $40, which is nothing. But the, the Coursera is an unreal resource. Like the quality of the courses on that. There was this one course on circadian rhythm biology. Uh, and lucky enough, I actually did it and have all the materials from it, but it's gone off now. And like, it is phenomenal. It's unreal. I like, got, it's savage. Uh, thanks to Danny Lennon to introduce me to that website. Nice. Um, and Maladin Janovic. Um, so next thing is their employment. And just, and you can dig into this now. What I found very interesting from your video um, on intake when you got into employment was kind of again and this goes back to sharing our perceptions that we could perceive someone's employment as being stressful but to them like they love it like it's not stressful to them at all and then you were like you could look at another person's employment and it might be that many hours but they bring work home with them and they're always thinking about it and, it's, and it is stressful so I thought that was a very good point to bring up but definitely get into employment occupation hours and, and total stress from their uh, from their job yeah um I mean, this is essentially, um, you know, 25 or what was that? 33% of their day, right? If they're working a pretty average eight hour day, um, you know, which is, you know, pretty average <laughs> as far as like most of the world's concerned these days. Um, not like your 80 hour week currently between work study and your family. Eh, yeah. What is that? Right. Um, but, but you opt into something like that. Right. Um, but I also have realistic goals for myself, right? For what I need to be able to accomplish at the end yeah. of my day. I'm not chasing um, competition while, while shouldering all of that workload, right? That's just ignorant um, to think that you can do that. Um, but then again, Instagram tells you that you can. If you work really hard and you constantly grind, you will get everything that you want. Um, sorry. <laughs> I, I felt a rant coming. I had to kill it before it got too far. Um, yeah. So occupation, right? This is magical, right? So, you know, let's assume, uh, let's, let's start with some assumptions that people are at least trying to get eight hours of sleep a night, right? So that leaves 16. The standard work day is eight most of the time. Um, so that leaves you eight other hours to be screwing around or doing whatever that you do, right? So 
when we think of our time allotment around there, um, you know, our, our time training is very insignificant in relationship to that, right? The, the percentage of time is 124th for the standard person. If we're talking gen pop, that is training an hour a day, you know, a couple times a week or, you know, four or five times a week, whatever the case might be. Um, it's still insignificant, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, if we're looking at um, the components of balance, right? So how often is a person sympathetic? How often is a person parasympathetic and parasympathetic, obviously being the rest and digest and, you know, slowing things down um, component. Um, that is truly what's going to be the equalizer in how much somebody can actually take on, right? So, it, you know, going back to the principles of if you can't recover someone, putting more stress on them is a stupid idea, right? Just well, let's be simple with that, right? Yeah. Um, so under those terms, then, um, this is what gives us that idea, right? And by seeing what these numbers look on, like on paper, you have to play devil's advocate and you have to try to prove yourself wrong. If you look at that, And you're like, all right, cool. This person has eight hours a day. Prove yourself wrong. Find out if there is more to that story. And then get an idea of what that story looks like, right? Because you could have eight hours and on paper that, you know, they can say like my day is a seven as far as stress. You're like, all right, well, seven is not. It's not a 10, you know, 10 being the highest, it's, it's not a, a bad, but you find out it's a seven all day, right? <laughs> like, but if we're thinking averages, that could be a 10 for, um, you know, X amount of hours, you know, like let's say a, a stress level of 10 for, um, for two hours and then a stress level of five for the other six hours that puts you at about a seven, right? Or so, so um, that looks a lot different than it just being a seven, than it just being like, I have probably one hour of real stressful work every day, but it's like a 15 out of 10 and the rest of the day is like a two, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that math doesn't work, but you know what I mean? Um, actually, it might. Yeah, either way. Um, so under those terms, it, it gives you a little bit better idea, right? And then Um, that brings up like one of my new favorite questions of just asking people is like, are you busy or are you actually stressed? Right. So like the, the the nomenclature around that, or just like the the general thoughts is like, there's so much pride in being a stressed out person, right. And a busy person. It's like, no, you just have a lot of things to do. Like what you name it changes all of that. Right. So, um, you know, being able to look at that stuff and then knowing the rigors or having a general sense of what is included within their daily um, performance at their job is important too, right? Like traders and financial people that are handling other people's money and are responsible for that, that might be very stressful for an entry level person or a high level person, right? At the same time, for someone that's seasoned and very good at that and has high levels of confidence, that may just be like, I come in. I do my job really well and I go home and I'm good. Right. So, so understanding where they sit in that vocation, the more you kind of understand their personality and where they sit with confidence and all that stuff could also change things. Right. And, um, I mean, hours are, are the clear indicators, right. Um, and you posed a great, um, intro to that. It's like, do you bring work home? Like, what does that look like? Um, and how much of your day can you actually separate out and say that like you're actually relaxing? Cause if they're, if they're working 10, 12 hours a day and then they're trying to kill it at the gym for 90 minutes a day, that's a lot of intensity per se, you know, in comparison to being parasympathetic and resting and recovering. So it all comes down to a balance. And if we're thinking about recovering them on a daily basis or, you know, a multi-day basis from life, that's more than just their training. Right. So that means their nutrition and, their behaviors have to counter not only their training, but the rigors of their day as well, which is often overlooked because, you know, traditionally you're thinking within um, fitness that it's like, oh yeah, we just got to make sure that, you know, they don't have too much DOMS or they're recovering or their nervous system's fresh enough for them to go deep on that next tough back squat workout or whatever the hell it is. Right. Um, So it's looking at it, you know, a little bit more, um, macro in the sense of looking at more things, but micro in the sense of like being able to hammer all of those little pieces, right? Rather than just being like, all right, cool. I gave them enough carbs to to counter the amount of repetitions that they did and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah. 
you, you did a, you did, you did 33% of your job today. Good job. Right. <laughs> like, Cause there's another 16 hours that need to be accounted for. Right. That sounds snotty, but when you start thinking about it the other way, then it's like, Oh yeah, there, there is a different component to that. Right. Yeah. I, I think, um, you, you go, you get a, don't be far from my mic there. You know, you get like, uh, the likes of, uh, Joel Jameson and, you know, James Tinker Smith and, uh, you know, they, they might use different terms, but essentially like coaches need to start seeing themselves more as um, stress load managers than anything else with their clients, you know? So in terms of we need to stop just thinking about the one hour that they're with us when they come to the gym for the session with us and start, you know, thinking about what else is going on in, uh, in their lives outside of the, the gym in terms of the stressors throughout, throughout their day, in terms of their job and their family. And, you know, then if you have parents, they have kids, and then there's nutritional stress and circadian rhythm stress. And, you know, we really need to step back and say, we really are global load managers and, and need to have appreciation for the stress physiology and making sure that the, we're, we're prescribing the correct dose response in terms of exercise for that individual on a moment to moment basis. Cause obviously that's dynamic and, and it's always in fluctuation too. Yeah. I mean, dude, that's, that's why everything needs to be looked at as tentative, right? Knowing what the person's schedule looks like and if there's sales seasons involved in that. And mm. You could put the be- together like the best long-term plan or, yeah. you know, your, your schedule for the year, but your test periods fall like right before on or after a heavy, um, you know, end of the quarter for sales. And it's like, you just crap the bed and you actually now look bad because you layered that so piss poor that mm-hmm. they failed those tests, even if the training was point, like was on point, right? Yeah. They failed those tests, and that compromises not only your um, your ability for competency within your client, but it also, you know, that I mean, that inherently just drops the trust level on there. It's like, man, I trusted you too. I I killed myself in the gym, and look what happened, right? And that that's not their job to understand that. That's our job to understand that, right? So. It, it comes down to planning pieces and just even knowing, you know, the rigors of that and being able to have those conversations. It's like, what, what does your job look like? What possible stressors are coming up within there that we need to plan about, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and then there's the unforeseen, right, that we have to worry about with, like, um, other things coming out of completely left field for somebody where it's just like, man, well, I had this great plan, like, with all these things and now that's when it's like, yeah, who cares? it's tentative anyways. Like yeah. it needs to be worked around them. Right. And it, it's not like they don't need to change their behaviors, but there are going to be unforeseen things, you know, that could be medical, financial, there, there's going to be stressors that come up. Like we live in real life. Let's get over that. Right. So the perfect plan is only perfect when it works with that person. That means it needs to be dynamic in the words that you use and it needs to be, um, you know, tentative on paper, you pencil that in, man, and use permanent marker, you're setting yourself up for a disaster on that. You need to be thinking about all things to recover every day, every bout with stress that comes through. If you can't grasp that yet, then you know what direction you need to take your education and start understanding what things affect those so that you can deliver the resources required for that person to be successful. But it is a two-way street, right? They need to be able to, you know, take advice, be coachable, um, be in a place where, or be nurtured into the direction to actually have behavioral changes. But it also takes the right prescription to do that and not giving them too much at the wrong time, just like any other skill, right? You're not going to train a snatch or a clean and jerk when somebody is in the worst place in their life and they're so tired, they can't remember what they did yesterday. And you're like, you know what? We're going to start working on arguably the toughest skill in weightlifting starting today. And they're like, okay, cool. And the brain's just like, nope. Right. It's the same thing with behaviors. Like their willingness, A is going to be changed by that and B their ability to really integrate themselves into that is going to be limited even more. And then that was just a piss poor prescription from you. It's not that they couldn't do it. It's not that they didn't want to do it. It was horrible timing. It was a bad description perhaps. Yeah. Right. And that's your bad as a coach. That's not like, that's not like they're a bad client. They're not changing the way I want them to. It's like, maybe that was just a horrible idea to begin with. And you need to know that you were wrong so that you can regress that and actually turn it into something that they can start to create frequency around and then build consistency on top of. Mm. Content is important, but context is king. 
in terms of beautifully the said. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know Brian Mann speaks about that too. Uh, he did an interview with um, Martin Bingizer on the Hammer Media podcast, and he was speaking about uh, you know stress and adaptation. And he was saying that with the students in the university that he currently works at, every time like clockwork tests came around. He's like athletes just their 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 adapt adaptive capacity just went round. and he's like you know injuries and illness with them. and like he's like we're starting to notice a trend around test time so he's like we are going to decrease train frequency and he's just like you know obviously when they started to realize that trend they're at least stopped getting ill and stopped getting so many injuries in around that time like they pre planned for it yeah well think about that right if you're tired right? Like mentally, physically, all those types of things and stress, right? Which is going to have a huge consideration upon that. Um, And you're covering that up with pre-workout caffeine through the day. And don't get me wrong, man. I I have my days where I'm over caffeinated. I can be real about that. But you're covering up things that are warning signals for you, right? So if you're tired, your nervous system shutting down based off of resources, amount of sleep, ability to recover, and you're like, yeah, now I'm going to get under a bar and I'm going to do, you know, 150 kilos for back squat. It's like, <laughs> you get hurt. What did you think was going to happen? Your body has told you for the last like week and a half that it is tired. And you are like, you know what? We're just going to, we're going to hide that. Hmm. Right. And that's, that's a facade that allows you to get through that day and, you know, kind of get through those motions. Right. But it doesn't cover up what's actually going on under the hood that your body's trying to prevent from happening and going awry based off of that, right? You know, for me, being over caffeinated means like I might fall out of my chair and get hurt because, or I, you know, I'm, I might cramp a little bit when I'm, I'm at a standing desk, right? Like that's the worst that's going to happen to me right now, right? Because I'm going to, I'm going to periodize that and think about, well, all right, like after the semester, I'm going to recuperate, I'm going to drop levels, I'm going to come back from that. But there, you know, you can think about it along those lines, but I'm not inherently putting myself under more and more pressure and rigors of training while in that state, right? Obviously, there's a neurological component that I'm going to pay for on the other hand, because there are no free lunches. Mm. But, um, you know, when you're thinking about injury prevention as a coach, right, like, it's your job to give someone the most productive, um, you know, approach at their fitness and their goal while preventing you know any harm that can be done within there yeah. right and, and if you don't even know that somebody's taking pre-workout that's a whole other problem right it's like why haven't you had that conversation mm-hmm. right so lots to think about on there and then the intake kind of ties that all in right that that is an initial conversation thing but if you look at that once and you never look at it again you're arguably not doing your job right that's a that's a quarterly Um, if not, you know, was it bi-yearly twice a year, um, um, approach of looking like, all right, how have these things changed? Right. Like finding out that your client's gone on antidepressants that changes things, right? Like that, that tells you a lot. And if you don't know that that has switched, then you're, you're asking for a world of trouble, just purely being, um, ignorant to what's going on or naive to what's going on because you never had those conversations. You know, it really comes back to obviously educating your clients along the journey. I remember Patrick Ward, um, you know, he kind of alluded to this too, that he told the story of like, you know, a client coming in and, and like Patrick would have been a very um, early resource for me in terms of appreciating recovery and heart rate variability and how to manage stress in terms of, you know, stress physiology and what was appropriate for an individual in that given moment in terms of what they were um, able to adapt to. And like he would often say, like, you know, his clients come in and they're erect and he'd like, listen, what we have on paper today and what you kind of really want to do is just like, you're not in the right position for it. And he's like, that's just all part of the education process. He's like, he, he said he would often say to him, you, you know, you've hired me, you paid for my services to get you the results you want. And he's just like, hey, if we do this today, this is not getting us closer to our results. And he was just like, you know, it kind of made me appreciate, you know, that, that communication, that education piece, and to obviously build up that trust too from the client with you, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you're not educating clients on components of self-care and even in understanding what it is that they're doing, so they don't need to be on the same exact level as the coach, but they, they need to know the whys around those pieces to mm. be... To, to break a codependency on there, 
Yeah. If you're holding, if you're like keeping, you know, the, the screen up so that you can do all your magic behind the, behind the curtain, then all you're trying to do is show off in front of your client and be like, Oh, look at this little trick that I did for you. Right. But if you can explain the why to them, it not only is it going to resonate with them and help drive diagnostically for them, like to nudge them in the direction of, um, of doing more, but it also allows them to align with it and, you know, truly be able to take these things on their own and, and be willing to share information like that. Like, you know, obviously in, um, I mean, it's a generalization, but I'd say a 35 year old may be more prone to tell me that there is a lot of life stress coming down on them opposed to a 24 year old that wants to bust their ass really, really hard. Right. If they're like worried that you're going to take volume or take some intensity from them, if they show a little bit of weakness, that's a problem. Hmm. Right. And, but someone that may be more mature in their athleticism may be like, yeah, coach, like I'm getting banged up right now. Like things are really tough for me outside of the gym. It's like, all right, cool. I want to make sure that you're still making one step uh, or like one degree of progress, you know, in that direction during this period. And that may be not killing you right now. Right. Or not challenging the system to the point of looking for super compensation and maybe just you know, getting them to getting it to resonate with them when it's like, this is a maintenance period now, right? Our progress is not going into the negative here, yeah. right? Where someone that's less mature on that level is going to be like, well, if I tell them like things are crazy, you know, my workouts are going to get easy. It's like, or you're just going to keep regressing, right? So like, which one pick easy or pick regression, but easy doesn't have to be boring, which is also, you know, that's where the creativity comes down for the coach, right? Mm -hmm. Like, can you write deload weeks and uh, maintenance periods, you know, entertaining enough where it's still enticing for the client? Because no, we're not entertainers by any means, but like you still need to keep their interest during this period. Yeah. Right. Because Especially if they're like, man, the last time I told them it was stressful, my workouts were stupid for like <laughs> four weeks. Right. And it's like, nobody wants that. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they need to understand that and be okay with that. But at the same time, if, if you understand the concepts around program design, nutrition, and lifestyle, you can make anything fun if you really want to. And if that's a value for you, right. But some clients, you know, they're robotic. They're like, coach, whatever you say, I'll do it. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't even get, you don't even get any kickback on that, which is obviously yeah. nice, but, um, uh, a different component of it for sure. Yeah, and uh, again, it, it comes back down to the, the, the coach-athlete relationship too and, and the coach really, really not, and client, I should say, athlete client. But, um, you know, it, it just comes back again to that relationship and the coach. You know, knowing the personality of that, that athlete and client because there, there can be times too where, you know, that individual that the coach is coaching comes in and, you know, they really shouldn't go through a grind of recession. But emotionally, mentally, the coach knows that they just need that. They just need it today. Like, they're just going to let it live. Like, they need that emotionally. They need to just do a hard session, even though, you know, physiologically, okay, they might recover operating for it. It might be getting as close to goals. In fact, it could be in the short term a little bit detrimental, but maybe just mentally, emotionally, they just need that, you know. And again, it just goes back to knowing the client. And then, again, context, as I said, is the king of, of all of it. Just wrapping up here, Sean, um, digestion and then um, one more after that is where your clients shop budget-wise. You mentioned a really good thing in the intake video where you were like, we need to be sensitive, I like that word, to, um, to the client's budget because you said they could be spending all their money to be able to afford our coaching and they don't have enough left over to get like the best quality food. So you're like, and we need to be sensitive to that. Um, you know, and not like be judging like, oh, they shop in this supermarket. They mustn't value food. It's like, no, it's just that they're 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 valuing the coaching more than, you know, they've decided that they want to spend the money on the coaching and do the best they can with the quality food they can buy is essentially what you're trying to get to. But first of all, digestion. Let's talk about that, you know, bowel movements, et cetera, and, and what, what the conversation is there. And then you can get into like uh, kind of the the where clients go to get their food. Yeah. Um, so digestion is interesting. Obviously, um, gas bloating and digestion. Um, those are always going to be signs of, um, some ill mechanics going on. So being conscious of that and understanding what those, um, kind of point to is always a, a, a good practice as a coach, especially when you start getting into, um, being able to prescribe 
uh, macronutrients and even micronutrients for that matter for an individual. And then also bouncing that off of medical history, previous experiences, so on and so forth. Um, intensity of training, all those things are going to be components, job stress, right? All those are going to be influencers on digestion since, you know, digestion is a component of parasympathetic rest and digest, right? No secret in that one. So if someone's not calm and their, their height, their, their height, I don't even know what I said there. They're running hot all day. I was going to say hyper for some reason, but they're running hot all day. Then, um, we can, we can make safe conclusions and not even an assumption at that point that at some point in the timeline of this, um, whether or not now, but in the future, there, there could be some compromising to their digestion and their ability to actually assimilate that nutrition. So um, keeping that in mind is important when we look at that. And that's, one, that's gonna be one of those like reading between the lines things. Someone um, has seven bowel movements a day and then you look at their stress levels at work, you're like, okay, I can start to see what's going on here, right? Um, and then you, know, you start to reevaluate pieces within that in context and try to prove yourself wrong, right? Try to find out what's actually going on in there by, um, you know, standing by one of those thoughts and then, you know, disqual trying to disqualify that from all the other details that you get in, right? Um, but uh, elimination is really big when we're thinking about bowels. Um, similarly, we would have to bounce some of that off of a schedule um, of how frequently they're eating and how much they're eating, mm -hmm. right? So let's just, you know, for the sake of, um, you know, polarizing it from the norm, let's just say somebody does really good on fasting, whether they know it or not, right? Like they typically eat like one really big meal a day and they may have like one snack throughout the day. But, you know, on, on you know, health wise, blood markers or they're healthy, like it's not a bad thing for them, right? So should that person have three bowel movements a day? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, how, you know, given their types of foods that they're bringing in, let's, let's polarize and make it even more extreme. Let's say that like 50% of their carbs are powdered carbs. Are they going to be having as much bowel now moving out compared to someone that was doing, you know, let's say 30 grams of fiber within the same parameters, right? So all those things are going to kind of change and you got to see those within context. But if we're talking about someone that's eating, let's just throw like the most average numbers out there, 2000 calories a day, three meals a day, um, and an average of, you know, 35 uh, grams of fiber a day. Now we can expect at least based off of um, commonalities, that that's even a word, um, that there should be a certain amount of bowel moving through the body. And if their nervous system is um, balanced in the sense of maybe 60% of their day is sympathetic and 40% of their day is parasympathetic, um, then we can assume that you know they're getting enough bowel movements throughout the day because motility isn't jamming up um, either way and um, there's enough elimination coming out as well, right? So the bulk of food versus bacteria versus cellular turnover and everything that's coming out um, the other side of that, right? So if none of that's happening, you know, the, the easiest one is like, I have zero to one a day, right? So not like, you don't, you don't have to be a scientist. Right? You're like, oh, something's wrong here, right? Um, so at that point, that's giving us an idea of, um, what does toxicity look like, right? If they're not pooping on a regular basis, then you can make assumptions that fat soluble toxins, hormones, um, all things of that nature, and even bacteria, um, that would be, you know, um, attached to bowel or coming al out along with the bowels may or may not be making it out at the rate that it should be. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, Normal strength coach, is this your job to be evaluating that? No, but it gives you context to think about nutrition, to think about toxicity, and to better frame what that all looks like for them. Because if they are a um, body composition client, guess what's going to be really hard to do if they're not pooping on a normal basis, right? Like it, it's, it's, it's pretty simple when you think about it along those lines, right? But if you're not even asking that, and if they're not pooping, what you know, and, and they have goals of putting more mass on, let's say, like if this is a male we're talking about, or even a female for that matter, no, that was a um, poor way to frame it. But um, if you're going to increase calories on someone, 
is, is that a good idea if they can't even eliminate properly right now? It's probably a bad idea, right? Um, so there's, there's definitely context within there, and then it just starts to give you insight into things that are going on under the hood. But it, it's important to stay within your lane on there and have resources lined up to be able to nudge people um, outside of your general reach that, that can help people with that so that you can set that person up to be successful. You don't have to work all the magic yourself, right? It's a, fitness needs to be collaborative in a sense where um, there, you know, there's other people that can work beyond your scope and there's also people within that that can um, give you perhaps a, a different perspective or a different lens to look at your um, your problem solving techniques as well as maybe tell you you're wrong or, um, you know, be able to help you work through your own biases within there. Right. So all those things work out really well. Um, and within the intake of that, um, you know, digestion ends up being kind of a, a huge component because, you know, someone that's complaining that they have low energy or maybe their goal is they want more energy throughout the day. They're not, having normal bowel movements either on, on either side of the extreme too many or not enough, then you know there's going to be an energy compromise within there. Not to mention you're spending a lot of energy trying to work through that stuff, right? Like there's no, there's no free um, contractions in the body. Right? Like the, the, the circular or uh, what is it, latitudinal muscles um, within the longitudinal it's been a while since i looked at it muscles within the small intestines like that those aren't contracting for free that costs atp as well right so um there's definitely a play within there um to think about in the, in the grand scheme of things within that mm, great stuff and then finally just moving into where the clients um get their food so just in terms of you kind of saying you know let's try not to to be too uh, quick to judge in terms of what they put down on their intake form, whether it's like organic or if it's just a conventional store, because again, there might be just a, a budget restraint there. Yeah. I mean, it gives us insight, right. To, um, for some folks, um, and this is a reading in between the lines ones as well is, um, you can look at what their, um, where they shop, if, especially if it's a local client and you have a good sense of like what that store name means, right? Um, and then it, if they are very privy to, um, you know, what healthy food looks like and they're choosing not to, again, this is an assumption. Assumptions are dangerous. I 100% agree with that, but that could give you some sense that there is budget restraints, right? So if they know organic is the, the best thing ever, right? And they're choosing not to, then that may give you some insight into their financial situation, which might not be the first conversation you have with them. They're like, so are you in the red right now? Like, how's your debt looking? Like, how's your debt to income ratio right now? Like, are you, are you feeling good about that? Right? Like, you're not going to have that conversation with them the first time. You might even not have that the first six months, right? But but knowing how that person spends money and um, things like that is a helpful thing down the line. Now, as far as what that tells you um, on the initial is, you know, if they're eating just normal foods, and again, we're thinking about optimization, um, the question then comes into like how much of your food is processed? Um, and then, you know, what are some going to be some of the easiest pieces that we can start to tweak for you, right? Like, is it more important for us to shift the quality of food or the type of food? And quality being like, let's just say, um, going from um, GMO pesticide to more organic, right? Opposed to saying, um, on, the, on the flip of that would be like, a lot of their food's processed, right? Maybe they're doing like, out here we have like Stouffer's and stuff like that, like just pre-made um, frozen meals, which, you know, could be better than eating fast food, right? Arguably, maybe it's not, but at least the food on the plate resembles real food, right? <laughs> at, some, at some level. So maybe it's getting them from microwave dinners to a little bit more um, real food, right? Or, you know, cooking your own real food. And, and that could be a, a bigger um, switch for them. But knowing the context of those places and convenience, because there could be another component where, hey, it's a block away from their job. And since they work 12 hours a day, that's the easiest way for them to pick up food, right? So another little drill within reading between the lines, like, what can that tell us? And then that crafts a better question that you can ask later on. So Sean, wrapping up, um, what are you reading right now? I'm, I've taken a break. Um, oh, you're like Mike Ban. Mike's in the same. 
I've, uh, um, I'm trying not to read any books at least for, I try not to, that seems so interesting. Um, for at least the next eight weeks or so I have, uh, I got two weeks left on this semester, like a week and a half. And then I have six weeks off in which I'm going to try truly try to, to deload the brain a little bit and like okay. fully recover from everything. So, so genetics, you're doing a, is it a master's or a doctorate? Um, this is an under, um, oh, is it? Sorry, it's an undergrad. Yeah, there. genetic cell and developmental biology. Um, who, who, where are you doing that? Uh, Arizona State University. Sweet, yeah, yeah. sweet, yeah. ASU. Nice. Yeah. Did you uh, did you put any thought into the dinner question? Yes, I, I knew uh, I had homework, so I, I came prepared. <laughs> All right, well, let me ask it. Let me ask it. So, okay, Sean, if you can invite five people to dinner, look, he takes a drink. <laughs> If you can invite five people to dinner, dead or alive, who would you invite and why? Well, let me let me qualify first. Can there be fictional characters within here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So top five. Um, we got Hippocrates. Okay. So um, good basis there. Um, I'm gonna go with one of my all-time favorite pro skaters that has been on every side of uh of the world as far as life and um, where he started and where he finished. Christian Hasoy, um, phenomenal pro. Um, love that guy. Um, let's see, as far as, what is that? That's two, right? Yeah, um, two. We're going to go Tyler Durden of um, Fight Club fame. Important person um, as far as <laughs> just, um, you know, really – keeping a perception on your own life and, and what really is important within there. Um, Walter Murch, Walter Murch, um, many may not know, but, um, he's a, a seasoned film editor of, uh, Francis Ford Coppola and, and many others. Um, probably like one of the godfathers of actual film editing and, um, creating continuity and edits, um, that were, you know, so perfect that the mind really didn't even notice that the camera angle has shifted within there. Mm. Um, and just like a master of his craft. And, you know, I see, and you know, it's my bias, but it, since I used to be in film editing, um, I see a lot of correlations between the assembly of um, program design, including nutrition, things like that, in the same sense of film where you have a lot of resources and it requires a level of organization to truly put something beautiful together for somebody. So, Sweet. Um, that really resonates with me. Um, you know, to, to keep this on a multimedia world, um, DJ shadow, um, would be a great person to sit down with as just like a true technician of, uh, music. And I'm, uh, mildly obsessed with his music for mm. the, <laughs> at this point in my life. Um, and then, uh, if we had to throw one more in there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with, uh, Paul of Tarsus. The old uh, Apostle Paul be a great one to sit down with talking about people who have suffered in their life and, and come out on the right side of that. So that, that's my five right there. I think that was six. Was it? I, eh, it was. I, I never said I could count. Uh, um, are you a movie buff? Are you big into movies? You know, um, I was a film major at one point, um, all these like 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have fallen off a bit just in, you know, time management and, uh, and resources to sit down and actually see something good. But um, yeah. I definitely appreciate a good, a good film for that matter. Yeah, it's great. So it's another form of creativity, another form of art to appreciate. Listen, Sean, that was fantastic. But a great hour of conversation there. I really do appreciate it. So I'm just going to wrap up. Um, if the viewers are wondering why it got a little bit dark, it's just it's a bit cloudy here in Dublin this evening because we've actually had beautiful weather here the last few weeks. Um, but uh, thanks a million, bud. That was fantastic. And uh, we'll get you back on, dig more into maybe the basic uh, basic lifestyle guidelines and maybe start digging into like how to calculate calories and get into our macros and our micros and how to set up a plan. And we will definitely dig into more um, deeper topics. But uh, I really appreciate your time. And to the audience. Bye, Viewers and listeners, thank you so much. Make sure you subscribe to us on all of the media outlets. So for the podcast, whatever app you listen to, be it iTunes or Stitcher, or we're all on that thing. We're on Spotify too. Um, and then make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and sign up for the newsletter so you get all of the updates from OPEX. So, Sean, so many you, options. Yeah, Sean, do you want to say, say goodbye there? Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Robbie is a slice as usual. And I look forward to chatting with y'all soon, man.
All right. See you guys. Peace.